The day began with the high style of a state welcome for the new president at Canadian Forces Base Uplands. Mr. Reagan was making Canada the site of his first official visit outside the United States. With him, he brought wife Nancy and a large group of cabinet secretaries and advisors. Canadian and American flags were everywhere. There was a 21-gun salute, and the guards snapped too as Governor General Edward Schreier formally welcomed Mr. Reagan to Canada. Then welcome to the house next door. Welcome to Canada. We, the people of the United States and of Canada, are more than good neighbors. We are good friends. The activity here on the Hill was the focus of the first day of Mr. Reagan's visit to Canada. But the grace of the welcome was marred by the loud voice of hundreds of protesters. We have two reports. Ottawa mounted its finest spectacle of pageantry to welcome Reagan to Parliament Hill. This was the first ever meeting between Canada's Liberal Prime Minister and the Conservative Republican President. The warmth of the greetings reflected the traditional relationship between the two countries. But the whole event was overshadowed by one of the biggest demonstrations ever seen here against a foreign leader. The demonstrators maintained almost constant heckling. Their protests were aimed at Washington's failure to control acid rain pollution and at Reagan's support for the right-wing government of El Salvador. Trudeau's welcoming speech seemed only to encourage the hecklers. Canadians are simply delighted that you have come to visit us. I love hecklers. I don't know about you, Mr. President. This could go on for a long while because to each of these manifestations, to each of these concerns, there are answers. You and I, your government and ours, your people and our, will find the answers because we have faith in the people of the United States. As you have said, Mr. President, the greatest asset of the United States is the freedom of its people. This freedom we enjoy, and this freedom you will feel amongst us. The usual contingent of school kids performed dutifully, waving their little maple leaf and stars and stripes flags. But the descent continued unabated as Reagan began his reply. The president chose to make a point about the demonstration rather than trying to ignore it. And yet Parliament Hill is more than an imposing symbol of your nation. It is also a landmark of the new world, a monument to the right of self-government and the value of human freedom that even sometimes, as you yourself have pointed out, makes raucous behavior <laughs> permissible. This the president went into a warm, almost sentimental description of Canadian-American ties. And so, Mr. Prime Minister, before we discuss the other important matters before us, I want to take this occasion not to talk about the affairs of state, but to speak from the heart to the heart to say to the Canadian people, the people of the United States do not merely value your friendship, we cherish it. We are here today not just to seek friendly ties with a neighboring nation and a world power, but to strengthen instead the deep, unbending bonds of trust between old and devoted friends. Merci, c'est un plaisir to be here with you today. The shouters and sign waivers in the end embarrassed Trudeau so much that he made an unscheduled return to the podium. Hey guys, when I go to the United States, I'm not met with these kind of signs. You know, we, the Americans have some beefs against us too, but we receive them politely. Now how about a great cheer for President Reagan? The plea for applause was an unusual, if not unprecedented way to get a display of warmth for a foreign dignitary particularly so when that visitor is the leader of Canada's closest friend and neighbor. But with the awkward moments over, for the time being, the Prime Minister and President left to get down to business. The crowds actually swelled as the lunch hour approached. Perhaps three to 4,000 at one point occupied Parliament Hill. Far outnumbering the protesters were the normal spectators at events of this sort. 
the merely curious, and those who wanted to wish Reagan well. Even among demonstrators on the hill, there was no real ugliness or threats of violence. The most unpleasant incident was the burning of the American flag. But even that symbolic act seemed like a pale imitation of past protests in more violent times. Later in the day, Reagan said he wasn't in the least bothered by the demonstration. It's difficult to imagine a presidential visit without some kind of protest. After all, they happen regularly in the United States. The scale of this one, though, is an indication of growing problems between the two countries, a testament to the increasing concern among parts of the Canadian public. Peter Lloyd, CTV News, in Ottawa. You couldn't hear the demonstrators behind the grey walls of the Commons, but the first session between the two leaders took place against a setting of increasing conflict between normally firm friends. Alone, the lanky former actor and the ascetic former professor agreed it was time to cool it, to talk, as one senior official said, less in public about each other and more to each other about common grievances. There were no solutions, no one expected that in what was basically a get acquainted session. But the problems were defined and handed to officials to work out. As Reagan left the first round of talks, the demonstrators were still waiting patiently out on Parliament Hill, stubbornly chasing his car, waving their placards as it pulled away. His aides said Reagan was unperturbed by his reception. At a working lunch, in fact, he joked about it. And Trudeau, in apparently backing off from earlier criticism, offered lukewarm endorsement for President Reagan's policies in El Salvador, which was a key American objective. Did the Prime Minister tell you that he disagreed with your policy? No, we seem to understand each other very well. Thank you, Mr. President. Late in the day, more talks. There were four hours in all, this time expanded to include members of the cabinets of both countries. It was hard to see what the Americans were offering in return for support in Latin America. On all the issues critical to Canadian interests, fisheries, acid rain, air pollution, law of the sea, the Alaska gas pipeline, Canadian responses ranged from grievous disappointment to not entirely satisfied. But at an end of the day news conference, external affairs minister Mark McGuigan said the two leaders developed a good rapport and described the atmosphere as first rate. He said Prime Minister Trudeau, seeking details of the President's much-publicized North American Accord concept, sought and received agreement for a summit of three North American leaders to be held soon. Uh, the Prime Minister responded very favorably to the suggestion that, uh, that um, we, uh, we might from time to time have North American regional meetings, if I can put it that way, on, on various world issues. And we would be we would be very pleased if Mexico is also interested to go along with such meetings. So who won today's game of diplomatic chess? On almost all the vital concerns to Canada, problems once thought resolved, progress has been reversed. For their parts, the Americans, with clever negotiating ploys, have managed to place new grievances on energy and investment on the bargaining table for Canadians to have to deal with. As Canadian negotiators attend the gala reception tonight, there's no need to drink the poison cup of hemlock, but no cause to crack open the champagne either. Craig Oliver, CTV News, in Ottawa. But it wasn't all business on this first day of Mr. Reagan's two-day visit to Ottawa. We'll be back later with some of the lighter moments of today. Harvey? <laughs>